And now, it's time for that great new game show. It's the PowerShell Podcast. It's all about PowerShell and the PowerShell community. The PowerShell Podcast. And now, here's your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. Hey everybody, welcome back to the PowerShell Podcast. I'm host Jordan with superstar mega co-host Andrew Plaw. And today we have special guest Steve Lee, who's coming from the PowerShell team. You have all the inside information. I mean, I know it's open source repo, but... <laughs> yeah, it is an open source repo. Do you work on anything not open source? Uh, there are a few projects that we do um, that are related to areas that I publicly know, okay. right? Like uh, primarily I own um, PowerShell, uh, OpenSSH, and a bunch of related stuff like PowerShell Gallery, a whole bunch of modules, stuff like that. Um, there are there is work that we do with internal partners um, and some stuff that ends up being public. So one thing, I mean, it's public now because it's a public preview, but one thing that we had worked on prior that we didn't announce was this thing called Shark, um, which is short for combine of SSH for Arc. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Arc, it's Azure Arc, which basically, uh, sorry if you hear noise, my cat's trying to get outside. Um, so basically what Arc is, is not an acronym. It's basically a hybrid solution for Azure. So if you have on-prem machines, and you want to leverage a lot of the uh, management capabilities in Azure, then basically you install an Azure agent, keeping your machine on-prem, so it's not virtualized in Azure. And basically, uh, within the Azure dashboard, you can see those as though they were virtual machines in Azure. They can apply like automatic updates, automatic policy, all this, all this stuff they can do in Azure. So what my team did, because we own OpenSSH, is basically we have this feature called Shark, which basically, um, you know, as the name implies, SSH of Arc, it means that you can actually use SSH into your on-prem machine via Azure without exposing a public IP. All right, so it's a little bit, sounds a little bit complicated, but the, the basic idea is like, you, you wanna get remote access to your machine, you could be sitting you know, at a Starbucks or whatever, um, and you don't wanna open up a public IP because that's one of the worst things you can do because then you can get attacked, right? So in this case, you basically authenticate with Azure, and of course Azure has multi-factors, so that's additional security. And then once you authenticate, then we actually uh, basically create a tunnel via Azure to your on-prem machine. Uh, hopefully all that kind of makes sense. So that's one of the things that we did that was not public at the time we are doing development. Um, and, and that feature is not open source. Um, but we do leverage a lot of open source, like open SSH, of course, stuff like that. So is that one, I think there was a presentation of that at Summit this year. Yes. We're so talking about that. So a public so preview around that time frame. Yeah, so if it's something that people have more interest or like a deep dive, if they go to the videos for some of that year, there's going to be a session where it's covered in depth. It went, it, it went over my head pretty quick. It was, uh, it, it was a lot of uh, high level learning. It's, uh, I mean, like some of the additional work that we're doing in that space is trying to make it simpler for less, uh, I won't say less technical, but people are not as technical about SSH specifically, right? Because I think for a lot of folks, SSH. It is actually very complicated because, and it's complicated because it has a lot of security features. But for most folks, they don't really care about that. They just say, I want to be able to get access to the machine and I want to do it securely and easily. And that's what this feature is providing us to enable that. So it's secure, it's easier. Um, but to explain it, there are a lot of uh, technical details that kind of have to be explained. Securely feels like a constantly shifting landscape. What's secure today isn't necessarily secure tomorrow. Uh, that's very true. I mean, Security is hard. I mean, like, you can be secure today, but then, like, the attackers find something new, right? And then everything shifts. Now, you've been at Microsoft for, uh, you told us, 22 years in your little bio. Um, how did, like, what did you start off doing at Microsoft? How's that kind of career trajectory been? And when did you move to PowerShell? Oh, that's a good question. So I'll, I'll be honest, I don't remember the exact timeline these days because it's been so long. And I, I'm not one of those who kind of remember those details. Um, so... I actually, let's see, I graduated late uh, in the 90s. I actually didn't start at Microsoft as my first job. I actually started at Boeing in um, the computing center. I didn't make planes. I was in the Unix, develop, uh, Unix center doing basically tech support. And basically what's kind of interesting, and, and of course that's a local, that used to be a local um, company in Washington state. They, they've moved out their headquarters. I don't know where they're at these days, but, but no one really around here cares anymore. But um, at that time, it was interesting, I was a contractor and they sent out a company-wide email that layoffs were coming. And I said, all right, I'm not gonna hang around for this. And I had a contact at Microsoft doing uh, Internet Explorer for Unix. So my background is Unix. 
Um, so, and, and people may not be aware that there was an index for, for Unix. And when I say Unix, I don't mean Linux. I mean like the old classic AIX, Solaris, HP UX, uh, you know, all the stuff that people don't use anymore um, because Linux kind of took over. But anyways, back then, um, Internet Explorer was like the de facto, essentially the standard for, uh, you know, browsers and people needed it on non-Windows systems. So I was on a team that kind of ported it to work on Unix systems. And um, what I was not aware of is that that was a very short-lived project, so about maybe a year. And I was a contractor at the time. So this would have been maybe around 99 or so. So then um, that short-lived project kind of was done. I mean, there was no more additional enhancements being done. So I had to look for another position. So I interviewed a bunch of different teams at Microsoft, and I ended up on the WMI team. And um, hopefully, you know, most folks know what WMI is, or it's an older technology. Um, I'll show you can kind of say in a sense spawn from WMI. Um, but anyways, I was on WMI team. So way back then, what WMI was, was not a product that was shipped in Windows. And, and for those who don't know what WMI is, it's basically an abstraction. Um, it's based on COM that allows you to kind of query a whole bunch of different information from the um, operating system, right? So you can get like storage, network, compute, through a single type of interface, it's object oriented because that's what Windows. That's how Windows differentiates itself from Unix. Um, but back then, we were basically doing a what's called an out of band release on MT4. So that's how old this stuff was. Um, I don't remember all the, the specific timelines. At some point, maybe like within like three years, became a manager, um, and then I was still in the WMI. Team. WMI was a much bigger team, a much bigger technology. You know, I had like remoting. It's kind of like if you think about PowerShell, I had like remoting, had scripting, had security had providers, which would be kind of like commandlets. So that team, I was on that team for a while. And at some point, we started the WinRM project. So I was actually on that project from day one, WinRM, Windows Remote Management. Um, because, you know, we were initially, and what people may not know, is initially the focus of WinRM was uh, something called SOAP, uh, or SOAP XML over HTTP. So it wasn't exactly SOAP. It was more like XML over HTTP. And we actually had a prototype that we demoed doing interop with the uh, Sun Solaris because it had an implementation. Um, and the idea was, and again, I, I'll give additional context. I don't know if people really care, but um, there's an organization called DMTS. So there's like a standards body, Desktop Management Task Force. And I used to be a member of that task force. Um, you know, there's one spec that I wrote that's published on there. Um, but that's where SIM comes from, Common Information Model, and MOF, you know, Managed Object Format. That's where all those standards come from is from DMTF. And Microsoft has been, I think they're one of the founding members of the DMTF. But, other big companies like Intel, IBM, HP, they're all members of DMTF, and it still exists today. Um, so anyways, so WinRM was one of the standards that we created at Microsoft, um, and we kind of you know, pushed that, and that ended up being WSMAN. You know, so WinRM is the Windows implementation of WSMAN. WSMAN is the standards body one that's interoperable. So I was on that project for a, a while. Um, at Microsoft, it's not unusual to have reorgs. Um, you know, basically the one thing I do appreciate, although it can be a little bit disruptive, is that you know Microsoft doesn't sit still. Um, I don't want to throw out some other companies, but there are companies that kind of like sit still in their success and then they kind of get irre irrelevant, right? So Microsoft does continue to watch. And, and to be fair, I've been through three CEOs, right? Like Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, now Satya. So I, I've seen failures. Like Windows Phone, unfortunately, was a failure. It, it didn't have to be at it, but it was. Um, but anyways, um, so. One of the reorgs that we did is we merged the WMI and WinRM team with um, what was known at the time MOM. So this was NetI, and NetIQ was an acquisition. This became Microsoft Operations Manager, which later became SCOM, which is System Center Operations Manager. So that was like one team. And the reason that was merged because Operations Manager would rely on WMI you know, as the abstraction layer to do management of Windows systems. And then much later, that they decided that it didn't make sense to have a platform team and a product team merged. So WMI was put back into Windows. And then I forget exactly what happened, but basically PowerShell team and WMI team got merged together. So there's some commonality there. Um, and so from there you have, uh, and before that, I think like that's where Wimic came from. Like Jeffrey Snover's one of the first projects I'm aware of that he did was like Wimic, which is built on top of WMI. And a lot of those ideas ended up becoming into PowerShell. So much later, um, then there was some discussion about, all right, what's next for PowerShell? And, you know, I think everyone's saying, all right, Azure is shifting. It used to be called Windows Azure, and they dropped the Windows part because now it wasn't just about Windows, right? It's about Azure and Linux and whatnot. And then we said, hey, you know, if we want to get more Linux users on Azure and Linux users on PowerShell, you have to be open source. Like Linux users are typically not going to use closed source products. Um, so if we're going to be open source and cross-platform, then for me, that was... Pretty much around the time I kind of like took over the PowerShell team as the engineer manager 
Um, Because that was exciting to me. It's like, all right, this is a completely new thing. We're going to work out of GitHub. We're going to be taking this proprietary source code out of Windows, making it cross-platform, porting it to, at the time, called .NET Core, um, you know, and and all that good stuff. So that's where, and to be honest, I'd have to look through it probably some Wikipedia page on Partial Core 6, but that, that's around the time, whatever year that was, um, that I kind of uh, took over as an engineering manager for uh, PowerShell. And now we call it just PowerShell 7. So that, that was kind of like a brief, but somewhat detailed parts of early on. So I, I guess it makes sense then with uh, a lot of things with PowerShell 6 it, uh, first came out, I guess PowerShell Core as it was. There were things in there that were completely foreign to me as a, a just a 100% window shop, like Turner operators. I'm not sure if that was a... That was a little so bit later, I, but yeah. A little bit later. Yeah, so a lot of stuff came in there. So as, as a lot of the folks on that, when you went to core, as to try to have it have more of a Linux feel to it, or is it more to keep the, the Windows feel just with Linux, the ability to, I guess, interact so, with so it? So the early um, priority for PowerShell Core 6.0 was simply to get it working um, more intuitively and naturally on a non-Windows system, right? The one thing you have to keep in mind, like the Windows partial code base was when it was written many years ago, like more than 15 years ago now, it was never intended to ever be on non-Windows. So they made a lot of assumptions about like the, the file system, you know, the backslash versus forward slash um, and things like that. So a lot of those changes were really, so partial core six itself, partial core six, uh, 6.0 specifically, didn't have a lot of new capabilities. It was really just a porting effort to make sure that, you know, if a Linux user, so, so the primary scenario there was really, you're a Windows admin, you're now asked to kind of manage some Linux systems as well, then you can take the skill set that you develop on Windows and apply it towards Linux to some extent, right? You're not gonna have all the commandlets, but you can at least use the same language, syntax and whatnot. Um, and then we had some proof of concepts where we showed how you can wrap, you know, like a Linux cron job as a PowerShell object and stuff like that. So those are still checked into the repo. That's stuff I wrote a long time ago. So, so that was pretty much the 6.0 release. I think not until 6.1, when we kind of had like a solid code base. And we've been releasing every year um, pretty much. I mean, we kind of had a little missteps once in a while. But um, 6.1, I don't remember really exactly the feature set, but that's when we started looking at, all right, what are the main apps of the, the community? And we did add some features there. I think the Ternary operator and all the language changes came in as part of PowerShell 7.0. Um, <laughs> because we, the, the thing is, so just to be clear, like we decided... Uh, along with .NET. So .NET dropped the core out of their name, right? So now they're just known as mm -hmm. .NET. So there's .NET Framework and .NET. And at that point, we said, hey, you know, we should really drop the core. And the reason we, they dropped the core and we dropped the core is core as a name has an implication that it's smaller, right? Um, and, and to be honest, .NET itself has actually grown to be, uh, now it doesn't have all the same capabilities as .NET Framework because they had explicit decision to, to not carry some of those forward. And similarly in PowerShell, seven, we decided not to carry some stuff like snap-ins and whatnot, like stuff that didn't really make sense for the next 10 to 20 years. So, but we wanted to drop the core naming. So we decided, all right, we're just going to call it partial seven. Seven is a major number change. It's going to in indicate, you know, this is a major thing. Um, and for that release, we want to make sure we have some, um, you know, substantial features that the community has been asking for a long time. And some of that was these language changes, you know, ternary operators and the null coalescing stuff. Um, a lot of these, to be honest, come from, PowerShell users who are also C-sharp developers, so they're very accustomed to these language features, so they might seem a little bit obscure and advanced for uh, someone who's quote-unquote purely a scripter. Um, but again, it's opt-in, you don't have to use it. So, but one of the reasons we wanted to kind of have a focus on the language side is, you know, the reality is if we keep adding language features, people can't use it for like at least five years until that becomes the common version of PowerShell, right? Because in mo most cases for enterprises, they have like a mixed, they don't roll out the latest version across their entire enterprise. It's just too risky for them. So they're going to have a mix of 5.1, 6, 6, 1, you know, 7, whatever. So, you know, that's why we don't have as many new language features now, because if we introduce something like in 7.4, we don't expect huge uptake until like 7.6 or 7.7 comes out, right? So it, it's uh, so, so it's better in some sense to have investments in other areas where people can take advantage of it more um, immediately, if that makes sense. So PowerShell is open source. Um, you know, you're, I guess, a, you interact with the public. You're, you have to respond to them in, in certain ways like that. What's it been like over the years? Um, 
like kind of seeing the world work on getting better at communicating and kind of figuring out how to communicate in a way that's kind, efficient, that works. Um, you know, how is that now compared to five years ago? And, and how do you see that changing, if at all? Um, I think some things have changed. I mean, like early on, um, it was also, keep in mind, like open source was also a new experience for us at Microsoft um, way back when we first open source, right? Like, I think the only project that I'm aware of um, that at least is well known that open source before us was done at itself. Um, so up until then, um, you know, it was not, should not be surprised to folks like open source was something you did not touch at Microsoft, like under Steve Ballmer basically. And, and I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, but there's a lot of, you know, at that time misunderstandings about if you open source something or if you touch open source, doesn't mean you have to open source windows and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of that got resolved, right? Um, but one of the things that people have to realize is that when you work, open source is a, like a, double-edged sword, right? Like there's a lot of benefit. Like we get immediate feedback, we get contributions. Um, but the downside that people may not understand is like whenever we get a pull request, which we definitely appreciate a pull request, you know, is like code, right? Like a contribution, um, yes. Or even if you open an issue that automatically creates work on the team, right? So it means that we got to look at the issue. we got to respond. If it's a pull request, it takes longer because we have to review it, make sure the quality is good. Um, and whenever we have, Whenever we do that work, it means that we can't do feature work, right? So it's, it's a trade-off. Um, I, I think it's a valuable trade-off in the sense that, you know, we don't know everything. Um, and so if there's stuff that the community or customers need that is not on our radar, that's the best way to inform us. Because, you know, in the past, when we were in Windows, Windows shipped in long ago, like every three years. So we do one year of planning, one year of execution, one year of validation. So by the time it goes out, then people tell us you got stuff wrong. Guess what? It's going to take another three years to fix that. And then who knows if things have shifted again, right? Now, as far as the community goes, the other thing that's important is a lot of the contributors um, in open source in general are not professionals. Like we are fortunate that, you know, as Microsoft employees, we get to work open source and we get paid for it. Um, but by and large, the community are volunteering their time after the regular jobs. <laughs> and some of them are like students, you know, or some are like just hobbyists. So people sometimes can get a uh, very, let's say, emotional or heated in certain discussions um, and from both sides, right? From, uh, you know, we're human. Sometimes we get frustrated and obviously with a written communication style, you don't have, you know, facial expressions. You don't know if somebody's sarcastic or joking unless they use emojis. And then even if you use an emoji, you don't know exactly how to interpret that. So if somebody's having a bad day, uh, whether it's the community or a Microsoft employee, sometimes they'll write something that's not, the best way to write it, right? I've seen that, it happens. Um, you know, part of my job is kind of, uh, you know, if people see that from the Microsoft side, by, by all means, you know, ping me on Twitter, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll make sure like you understand what's happening. Um, I also get pinged on my side from my employees, like, hey, there's some contributors or some community folks that are not following a code of conduct, right? Trying to be professional, be polite um, with the best intentions. And then I'll try to chime in if I need to, so. I think overall, I think that has improved because I think the awareness of code of conduct is more prevalent now than maybe even like 10 years ago. Um, but there's still spots of it, right? Like there's always new people joining the community. They don't quite understand how the community is supposed to work. Um, a lot of times people who report issues, they, the reason they report issues is that their hair's on fire, they're frustrated. Um, or, you know, there's many times where we do a breaking change and, you know, under our limited analysis, we think it's not gonna be highly impactful. It impacts somebody in the wrong way and maybe we didn't fully explain our reasoning. Um, yeah, I get it, you know, and, and sometimes I just have to apologize and, what, and then we have to decide what we do about it. But I think by and large, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure working with the community. I think there's a lot of great folks out there. There's always gonna be a few bad apples, but you kinda just have to, don't let that get you down too much. Yeah, I like the way that Jason Helmick introduces, or at least the most recent PowerShell community call with reminding you that there's a, a human at the end of your message who's going to be reading it. Um, and for me, in my experience in IT over the years, I used to kind of think of the big tech companies as just these strangers, like not you know, just unreachable. Um, and over time, I've realized that that's not the case. And, you know, by being kind and just communicating in a better way, it's just much easier for everyone and creates a lot less. It, it puts a lot less sand in your engine. Oh, for sure. And, and if you're polite, we're more likely to respond in kind and do what you actually want. Right. Whereas you put us on a defensive mode. It's very natural as a human to not want to do something for you. Yeah. Even just by having a positive interaction, maybe someone's more likely to give you one little tip or say like, hey, maybe check this out. Uh, whereas if you're rude, they're not going to give you that information. So it kind of, it's hurting you. It's hurting them. It's, I just love thinking of the efficiency thing. It's super inefficient to be rude.
Yeah, and one other point is, and I don't know if people have noticed this, is, um, you know, I think in the past, if you think about the PowerShell team, um, like when Joey was my PM counterpart, a lot of the meetings and discussions was primarily Joey and myself talking, or maybe Jeffrey if he popped in. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do, going back to the human element, right, is really have more of the PowerShell team members do the talking rather than me talking on their behalf. Because uh, I do want the community to know, like, you know, it's not just that there's people, there's actually a variety of folks working on this. Some new folks that come in, um, some older folks that still on the team, whatever. And I want them to know, you know, more about these individuals. And um, you know, my goal has never been like to be the face of PowerShell. Um, there, there's some part of it where I can't not be because I'm the manager for this project. Uh, but I do want to kind of also give recognition to um, other folks on the team. It just dawned on me that uh, Andrew and I have been talking about submitting to talk at Summit once and how nerve-wracking that was. And every day of your life, everything you submit is basically going to the public. <laughs> every day you go through more stress than uh, something we've been fretting about for a year. That's true. Uh, so let me, let me touch on that real quick. One, one of the things I've noticed, and I'm going to go back to like, you know, we have this monthly community call thing. And, and one of the things I've noticed, um, and I don't, again, I don't know if people have noticed along with me. So we have some great community folks who um, are really good at giving demos, right? Like not only are they developing some cool stuff, but they give some cool demos. And, and, and it's always great to have them present. And this is the same as someone presenting at Summit or PSConf or whatever. Uh, part of the challenge I've always seen is like, how do we get new folks coming in and presenting because if they have to follow like a rock star, it only makes it that much harder, right? Uh, and, and I want people to feel like the community is always have this ebb and flow, and we always need we always need new people coming in the community because if the community doesn't grow, then people will retire, people you know whatever, and the community will shrink over time. So how do we make it more you know inviting and inclusive to get new folks either presenting at conferences or presenting demos on a community call? And I think part of it is just you know. Uh, being okay to say, I'm new, uh, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm nervous, um, it's okay. Uh, that way other people feel like, you know, maybe it's not so bad that I can take that big step and do it myself. I think that who what you represent to people who are maybe newer in the community is the, you know, you're the programmer guy from PowerShell, super advanced. But it sounds like you're saying that even people who have a different background than you that maybe don't understand programming as well can still provide valuable insights and you'll still be interested in seeing a demonstration, even if you can follow the code and it makes sense. Uh, there's still a lot of value to having people contribute. Absolutely. I mean, like, we the at least going back to the partial project like our purpose is not to um you know just satisfy the existing partial users right um i think that we can all be better together as a community as long as the community grows and the only way it grows you gotta get new users interested and sometimes that's explaining things um in a different way um getting folks who are not classically developers um you know because partial script is not intended only for developers yeah we, we added some language features that are maybe more tuned towards developers because they were kind of like a, a loud minority um, but there are other things that we also try to take into account, which is, you know, there's a silent majority out there um, who may or may not be happy. And they're not always going to be the first one to step up and give us that feedback. I find that uh, segment of people interesting. The kind of maybe the people who won't speak up, who won't go to all those things, who are just kind of plugging away, using things regularly. Like that's a very interesting perspective to me. And I'm not on the PowerShell team. Like I'm very interested in seeing how regular people are using PowerShell, what they're kind of doing with it, how they're approaching things. Um, because even as a member of the community, I'm a bit biased in the code that I see, right? Like I use PowerShell regularly. The people who are in the community use it regularly that, that post blogs. So yeah, it's good stuff. I think it's okay to do that, right? But you just have to keep in mind, like, sometimes uh, how, how do people who are not in your bubble, if you will, uh, are going to perceive it? And, and not everything that you build or I build is intended for everybody, right? There are some things that are very niche, and that is okay, too. Yep. So earlier you mentioned working at Microsoft through three CEOs yeah. and the world has changed a lot over that course of time. From my observations as not a Microsoft employee, the culture has massively changed. And I think that a lot of other companies have felt that trickle down. Um, but with going through different leadership, how large of an impact do you feel the executive leadership has on culture? Like, is it 
where you feel like it's largely that, or is it kind of like this symbiotic relationship between the people and the executive leadership? Like what kind of has driven culture change in your experience? I think it's both tops down and bottoms up. Like keep in mind, I don't know exact numbers, but Microsoft today has something like more than like 150,000 employees or something like that globally. It's probably closer to maybe 180 or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, but when I first started, I think we we're like in the five digit range somewhere. Maybe, again, I don't want to guess because I'll probably be wrong, but maybe like in the 60,000 range, much smaller, right? Um, so I think when you're a smaller company, definitely more of the top executives can have an impact on culture. But like these days, uh, I'd have to count up how many managers I am from Satya, but it's not a small number, right? Um, so given such a large company, like even under Balmer, where it was like a decent sized company or even under Bill Gates, you had like big divisions, right? Like in, in the classic days under Bill Gates, you had like Office versus Windows versus, I don't know, whatever, whatever else they had at the time, like DevDiv and stuff. Um, and each of these big divisions have their own subculture. And then within a um, specific team, you also have your own culture within the team, right? Um, I can tell you like talking to other folks at Microsoft, the way they work and what they, you know, their culture is sometimes vastly different from my team. Um, and that's not a surprise. I mean, again, that's just human nature, but it's not like at Microsoft we have these, we do have some values um, that are expected, but it's not so prescriptive that everyone is exactly the same. Right? Um, but I would say like, you know, Bill Gates had his own style, Steve Ballmer, which was not a, uh, you know, classic computer guy, uh, more of a business guy had his, a different style. Um, and Satya now also has a different style. Like I definitely see the culture improving in terms of both, you know, diversity inclusion is one of like the core priorities at Microsoft. And I do, and that's something that takes time. It's not like you can just change people over, overnight. So that, that is something that's not easy. Um, but I've seen that change happening. Um, open source, of course, you know, that was a huge change, um, for Microsoft as a company. I think, you know, you've seen like some of the stickers Microsoft loves or hearts Linux. Um, that's not just a saying, it's, it's true. You know, that's, that's where Microsoft sees business growing into is like, how do we, um, you know, get some of that users. You know, we're not trying to like lose the Windows business. We're trying to maintain that, but also grow business outside of just pure Windows, right? So some of the stuff that, some of the value that we have in Windows, but besides PowerShell, you know, how do we get that across to Linux users? Um, things like that. So definitely, I've seen a lot of change, but I, definitely from both tops down and bottoms up um, and somewhere in the middle is where, you have different pockets of uh, culture. Again, Microsoft really is not like one company. It's really like a conglomerate of multiple different companies, right? Um, I'm sure Xbox has a wildly different culture than Windows versus like a platform team versus Azure, whatever. How good does it feel to work on something that is so appreciated by so many people? Obviously, you're going to get some of the negative feedback as the, you know, the one who kind of runs it. But how cool is it? I mean... For me to be even involved in the community in the capacity that I am, it feels really cool. But are you kind of used to it? Because you've been working with a huge customer base for a pretty long time. Um, so it's kind of like, again, like a double-edged sword, right? Um, because it is so well-known and popular, uh, mistakes can get amplified, right? So so in that case, yeah, that, that's, that part's not fun. Um, but I would say definitely very rewarding knowing like the work that we do has such a big impact on individuals and businesses um, you know, definitely versus if we were doing a purely new incubation project with an unknown. Um, and, you know, at Microsoft, you don't measure users in like thousands. You're really looking at millions and multiple hundreds of millions. So, you know, one of the, I'll, I'll put this out there, like, you know, the Pasha Gallery, which is something I own now, um, you know, we had a couple of challenges last year and maybe early this year. Uh, we had a couple of incidents where it kind of, had issues, you know, with whatever the case may be, it was down for whatever. And one of the reasons is the original design of the gallery code was not uh, designed for the scale of usage that we have today. So we, we just have so much usage um, that we, you know, one of the, some of the work that we're doing that, again, I, I don't mind talking about is we're not sharing like the code right now. Um, you know, we are over time trying to rebuild different parts of the gallery. So it'll be more, uh, you know, cloud, born in the cloud, uh, and scale um, because the current code actually literally runs on a few VMs, um, high powered VMs on a SQL server, right? And and so that that worked fine when we had a much smaller community and users downloading and publishing to the gallery. But um, these days, this is one of the reasons why statistics has been a problem. 
Um, if you guys are aware of that, like, you know, you can't go to the statistics page on Project Gala and get the, the latest results. Is the way it was designed was not uh, intended for how it's being used today. So the, you know, the stored procedures and tasks that kind of publish and consume those statistics basically take longer than a, a business day to process. So then it basically gets killed because the next day another one starts up. So there's a lot of these problems that we, um, you would say is a good problem to have where, you know, if we were a much smaller project, we wouldn't have these problems, but we wouldn't have the user base. So that's the trade-off, right? Like similarly on the PowerShell repo, <clears throat> you know, early on when we first opened it, we had, we were happy when we got to like double digits of issues. Um, and now we have something like 3000 issues and it's, guess what? Managing 3000 issues with a relatively small team, it's hard. So we need to now think about different strategies in terms of, all right, we don't want to keep all these issues open just to keep them open. Um, how do we kind of, you know, tackle some of these. And that's why, you know, one of the things that we've done as a team is we have community day. So this is different from the community call. So every Monday, you know, we have um, basically the folks working on open SSH, working on the gallery, PowerShell get, working on PowerShell. They spend time on basically Mondays. It doesn't mean they can't spend time on other days, but we're saying every Monday, all hands on deck, we're going to, you know, use this time to respond to issues, respond to PRs. At least that way, the community has some level of expectation on a regular cadence for response. Um, because again, like, you know, if you look at it from outside of Microsoft point of view, it's like Microsoft is a huge corporation. I just opened an issue. Why didn't they respond in the last two hours? And guess what? There's a human there that maybe in a different time zone, different country or whatever. Um, but at least, you know, having this community on Mondays ensures like over time you'll, you'll get some sort of response. So one go thing ahead, I love about the community is you mentioned that the gallery had some issues early on in the year it's going down and then you have someone like a, a deal that comes through with uh, basically teaches people how they can host the repo on their own. So if something does go down, they don't lose functionality. I, I just love how the community always willing to step in to even if it's not a permanent underlying cause issue is to help the community keep on going no matter what. No, I, I'm really always amazed by some of the uh, innovative and interesting work around this community has for, for regards of what are the issues. And, and by the way, a lot of times the community folks, uh, know more about parts of PowerShell than the team. And, and the reason is that the community uses PowerShell more than we use PowerShell in the sense that, you know, we use PowerShell for our development of PowerShell. We're not using PowerShell to manage, we're not IT, right? And, and a lot of the folks that use PowerShell is for automation, whatever. And we do automate some of our stuff, but we automate it for an engineering purpose. So we don't have a great visibility on necessarily real world usage outside of engineering um, because we are, that's why we rely on the community and customers to give us that feedback. Andrew, you're mute. I don't hear you. Yeah. Apologies. I, I can always tell when there's a new um, person hired on the PowerShell team because it seems like the first thing they do is just follow a bunch of people on uh, Twitter and kind of start <laughs> getting involved and, and get a feel for the community. That's probably true. I mean, like one of the things I don't publicize because I don't think it's necessary is when people come and go off the PowerShell team. Um, you know, I'll introduce them on like a community call if it's the first time talking, uh, but that's pretty much it, right? Like, um, I, I think people need to feel like, you know, guess what? The PowerShell team itself is kind of like this organic thing. People come and go for their own personal reasons. Um, and yeah, sometimes, you know, we have long term PowerShell people who leave and it's sad for everyone involved, but you know, they've, there's some decision they have to make for themselves. Not everyone's going to be on the PowerShell team forever. Um, some people will maybe, um, but yeah, I, I always love it. We get new people on the team and yeah, we've had a new a couple of new starts, not that recently, but a while back, uh, mostly from college hires. Very cool. So I kind of want to switch a little bit pace here and ask a question that I'm pretty sure a lot of people newer in the community have concerns about, or just in general, there's kind of um, people are opinionated about this and that is telemetry. So from your perspective, what is telemetry and how is it beneficial for someone like you that has limited resources and a lot of things that you kind of need to do? Yeah. So telemetry is one of those uh, topics that is dangerous to touch. All right. And, and I'll be honest, as a end user, I'm not a big fan of telemetry either. Um, so in PowerShell 7, by, uh, it, we do have an opt-out model, right? So by default, we do send some uh, little bits of telemetry. And, and just to make sure everyone's aware, like we do follow all the privacy compliance, GDPR, all that stuff. So it, 
everything that is um, sent by default has no personal identifi identifiable information. Like we, we gone through extensive reviews. Um, you know, we published a RFC a request for a common spec a while back when we first introduced telemetry, uh, outlining exactly what we're going to collect and what we're going to use it for. Um, and so we feel like we've been very transparent. Um, we also create like a public dashboard. Um, you don't get the raw data, but you kind of get a, a summary version, you know, of the growing usage of PowerShell 7, um, like what countries are using it. Um, we have also some data on like top community contributors and stuff like that. I think that, by the way, I think that Power BI is probably out of date. But anyways, um, you know, one of the, the questions we have is as a Microsoft funded project, you know, uh, basically how do we justify our existence? And part of it is we need to have data to show that we have growing usage. Um, and hopefully some of that usage grows into, you know, uses of other Microsoft services, which are paid, right? Like obviously we're free, so we're not directly, um, you know, contributing to the bottom line at all. Um, but that's the idea is like, you know, as long as we show that, you know, there's a growing usage, then the idea is like, you know, they're more likely to use Azure than something else, perhaps um, stuff like that. Uh, so we, there's, um, there's two parts here. Like we, we want to try to only collect telemetry that is useful besides meeting all the privacy stuff. Um, but recently, again, because we've been growing so much usage, I think um, Stephen had uh, posted, I think last month that we hit like a billion startups last month or something like that, right? Which is pretty huge. Um, but the problem is we have so much usage now that, so, so this may sound funny, but you know, we, um, as a product team, we have to be aware of how much we're spending in Azure. Even though Azure is a Microsoft product, uh, think of it this way, like the more uh, we incur in costs of Azure, spending a uh, compute time or whatever in Azure, it means that we're kind of taken away from a customer being able to use that. Okay, maybe another way to think about it. So we have to control our costs even though it's really moving like money from left hand to right hand. So we were actually hitting um, our cap on, um, so we use App Insights, which is the Azure offering for telemetry. Um, and you know, you can always inspect the packets if you really, or you can even, uh, the code is open source, everything's there. You can look to see exactly what's being sent. But um, we were having so much usage that we're actually hitting our caps that we had set for how much data we were gonna ingest, meaning receive in Azure. And I've had to increase it several times. And at this point, um, I forget what it is now, but it's like in the, I think it's in the multi-terabyte range or something like that per month. Uh, and, and we're not even saying like a, we don't feel like we're sending a ton of data, but if you think, if you multiply by the number of users, right? And by, it's not even number of users, like if people use it in a container um, and, and these come and go, each of them are sending just a small set of data so that we understand like, you know, our, our, where's our Linux usage versus Windows usage? Um, are people using containers versus non-containers and stuff like that? So that we can help use this to make decisions in the future, like, all right, Maybe there's a ton of usage in know, Azure Pipeline. So it's like, all right, what, what can we do to make that a better experience, make it more efficient, whatever. It's like, so this is what the telemetry are going to help drive some of these investments, right? Um, but anyways, yeah, so we've been having so much telemetry that we've really had to uh, set a cap. So right now we're actually, I believe, technically losing some level of data because I'm, in, in order for me to control costs, um, we've looked at other options to kind of reduce the amount of telemetry being sent. So we've had some PRs in PowerShell 7 to actually, we, we reviewed and said, hey, there's a bunch of information we're collecting. Like I think prior we're collecting stuff on, we don't collect the, what you're actually doing, but we do collect the type of stuff you're doing, right? Whether it's in a commandlet, an application, a function, or whatever. And we thought that we could derive maybe some interesting information from that. Um, it turned out that without knowing exactly what you're doing, we should cross the privacy line. We, it, it's not meaningful. So we, we cut a lot of that out of PowerShell 7.3 uh, telemetry. So that should actually help us as well because it reduces the amount of data we're ingesting. So hopefully it'll come back below the cap. Now, of course, the big problem here is uh, people like to stay on versions longer than we want. So it'll take a while before 7.3 becomes like the predominant version that will help lower the total amount of telemetry being collected. Um, but that's you know, some of the the quote unquote good problems that we have being a uh, popular product. Wow. Telemetry is a tough one because the value for your side is undeniable, but the desire to not give it up is also completely understandable for people on our side. So it's a, uh, there, there, there's, I don't think there's a way past the conflict on that one other than uh, just I mean, in this case, talk, talking it out. Like, like for me, philosophically, I think most, issues are not black and white. There's many shades of gray. I think telemetry is one of the rare ones that is almost exactly black and white, right? It's either, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you know, what we did do, um, you know, we, we looked at the feedback from the community and, you know, we made it very easy in our opinion 
to opt out, right? You can set an environment the variable before even the first start of PowerShell 7. Zero tumble shit ever gets set, right? Um, but we also try to make it so that the tumble shit itself being set is not intrusive, right? We're not trying to take up a lot of bandwidth. We're not saying, again, no private information. Um, so we don't know, like we have zero data. If, uh, if someone turns off tumble shit, we don't have a data point that tells us they turn it off. We literally don't know. So it's, it's quite possible that we actually have significantly more usage than we know, um, but that doesn't help us because we don't know that to be a fact. You, you can't uh, create a graph on the suspected. No, <laughs> we can't. No, that's good to know. That's a good explanation. Uh, I feel like less so these days, but back in the day, people would just think that uh, these big companies would just want to know every little thing that you're doing and somehow they have access to everything and, you know, there's definitely trade-offs, but that's not the situation here. So here's, here's one I would just um, make sure everyone's aware. Like, um, PowerShell is not associated with any kind of advertising tracking at all. Right? So this is not the same as like, and again, I'll throw out something like Google and Facebook where they deliberately have telemetry to track your users so they can present uh, relevant ads to you, right? PowerShell doesn't play any role of that at all. Like, again, you can look in the source code itself and see exactly what we collect. We, we do have a GUID so we know like, a unique user, but we don't know that you are that user, right? So it's, I think things like Google and Facebook is what make it so difficult because they've made an entire business out of using our information. So now when, let's be honest, another giant corporation comes in and says, yeah, we want your information, but there's nothing malicious or we're not going to profit off it. It's a, it's a tough sell, I imagine. It is. I mean... We, I mean, there's some ideas that we bounced around, like how can we make the telemetry more useful to end users or at least module authors, right? And, and it's uh, it's not easy to give, well, first off, like giving raw access to the to the data presents itself its own problem. Like maybe there's some stuff in there that can be discerned that we're not aware of by doing some weird correlation or whatever, right? So that's why we, we can't just, well, there's two parts. Like one is the large of the data, but we also don't retain it for that long. So we kind of summarize it. Um, but we, we're always open to kind of like, if someone has some like good ideas, like how to actually make this useful so that it's not just a one directional, uh, feed, I'm more than happy to have those discussions. Again, we need to, just, as long as we respect privacy. Now, earlier you mentioned you worked on the WinRM team for a bit as part of your transition in, towards PowerShell. Um, I'm kind of want to switch this into a WinRM versus OpenSSH. What are they kind of things? So what is WinRM slash OpenSSH and what are some of the differences? What's the current recommendation? Kind of what's the status with all that? So although WinRM and OpenSSH are both remoting related, they're, um, what they're capable of doing today is, is vastly different. Um, so WinRM was created at a time where Windows was looking for more of an opportunity to do some level of interoperability with non-Windows systems. Um, like again, when you think of when I think of WinRM, I really think of WSMAN. So WSMAN is this open standard um, by the DMTF Foundation, and I don't know if people are aware. Again, it's not as popular these days for various reasons, but um, WSMAN remoting is implemented in what's called a BMC, which is a Base Board Management Controller. So if you're not familiar with that, basically on server systems on the motherboard, there's this uh, what's called a daughter board, which is like a separate uh, computer if you think about it that way, um, that actually can control things like you know. If your operating system blue screens, then you can actually talk to the BMC and have it reboot the hardware. Or if you just got a bunch of new servers and there's no operating system on it, then you can talk to the BMC to do a pixie boot to do a self-install of you know whatever. Um, so that BMC, So one of the scenarios that we had originally for WSMAN, which was implemented, um, was to have all these BMCs. So these would be things like HP ILO, uh, Intel, uh, vPro, uh, Dell iDRAC. You know, if you're an IT guy, you may be familiar with these names. Um, basically, they implemented WSMAN. So that way, from a Windows client machine, you could actually do remote requests to these hardware devices to do management, right? That was the original intent, and, and it got implemented. Um, I think that, and, and again, WSMAN is all SOAP-based, you know, simple object access protocol, which is all XML. Uh, the world had moved on from SOAP and XML. They, they moved to REST, right, which is a little bit more like JSON over HTTP for the most part, although REST can support other things. But um, so... A lot of people moved off of SOAP. And the reason, like, SOAP, SOAP's pros and cons to get that into a little bit of that. Now we'll get to open this session in a bit. Um, is really, SOAP provides a lot of um, high level definitions of the contract of the protocol. 
That way, if you're talking to a arbitrary SOAP endpoint, you can expect how to do enumeration, how to do security, how to like, but the main downside is for people implementing those endpoints, there is a much higher bar. It's just a lot more work. Whereas REST, you basically say, I'm going to accept this HTTP payload. I'm going to respond with this thing. And you need to adhere to my rules, right? Versus I'm adhering to some um, complicated standard. So that's, in my opinion, that's why REST went out. It's just much simpler to implement. So WSPAN still exists. I don't know if all these um, BMC still use it or not because I'm not in that world anymore. So, that, so that's kind of like on the WinRAM side. And then, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we built on top of WinRAM then was partial remoting. So that came after WinRAM. Um, so this is where you have like a SSH or Telnet-like experience. You know, you can do inter-PS session. You could get a remote shell. Um, but again, everything is going over SOAP. Um, and SOAP being XML, the payloads have to be what's called base 64 encoded so that there's no uh, problem with having non-well-formed XML. All right, so that's way to put it. Um, and I think um, even before I took over the PowerShell team, like, SSH was something that I think Jeffrey had wanted to bring into Windows. But again, at that time for the company, open source was not something that you would touch. So it was always denied. Um, it was only until much later that we finally got approval that, hey, you know, the rest of the industry has adopted SSH as the remoting protocol. Uh, WinRM is really constrained to just Windows. I mean, there are some other efforts which um, we can talk about or not. Like there's this thing called OMI uh, that exists on Linux that uh, implements WSMAN. It was not that popular, it didn't really go anywhere. Um, but, you know, SSH is used all across Linux, Mac uses it as well. Um, so, hey, you know, it makes sense to rather than trying to create another standard for Microsoft and get other people to adopt it, let's adopt what's already in use, right? And that's really SSH. And specifically for SSH, open SSH was the implementation that we kind of uh, decided to put our, you know, uh, put our efforts behind. So we got that approved. Um, you know, we had to port it. Uh, give them a little bit of context. Open SSH was designed for what's known as POSIX systems, so those like Unix type systems. Uh, Windows no longer, Windows long ago did have a POSIX subsystem, but that hasn't existed since I think at least Windows NT4 or something like that. Um, maybe XP, I don't remember now the timeline, but so, so basically we don't have the equivalent APIs needed. So we actually, so a lot of the work that my team originally did early on was create an abstraction layer so that if you're calling a Unix API, we would actually call the Windows equivalent API or, or multiple APIs to do the same kind of stuff, right? So long story short, getting back to your original question, if you have existing applications, scripts, whatever, using WinRM, by all means, continue to use WinRM. Like it's still part of Windows. We're not removing it. It'll be there for probably 20 years or whatever, but there are no new investments in WinRM, right? So however it works today is how it's gonna work tomorrow in the next 20 years. We are making investments in OpenSSH. Um, OpenSSH in Windows is not where we're, um, we're making a lot of investments, but it's not exactly ready to necessarily be a replacement for WinRM. Um, but you know, we are making a lot of efforts there. Uh, so hopefully someday, and hopefully someday soon, um, and I'm not making an announcement here, um, that we can tell people, hey, we're ready for you kind of like shift off of uh, WinRM on OpenSSH. But keep in mind, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be done. Like, how do we get SSHD secure so that it can be enabled by default? Like WinRM is enabled by default, right? And that took a lot of effort to make that work. Um, so if you're not enabled by default, that's just one more barrier for people to, to adopt it. Um, there's no real client library that we support today for SSH, right? Like WinRM, we have a whole bunch of like uh, C Sharp and C libraries that you can use. So your application can talk WinRM directly. Um, today, if you want to talk SSH, and the way partial remoting over SSH works is we actually shell out to SSH executable to do the remoting. And then we stood in and stood out to do the communication. And that's not a good solution for everybody. Um, so there's a, definitely a long tail of work for us to kind of say, SSH in Windows is at a platform level that we want you to move it instead of WinRM, um, but we're not quite there yet today. Was there anything significant from an open source perspective about OpenSSH and Microsoft's involvement with it? Uh, I think the Big, so just keep in mind, like, although I like to talk a lot about OpenSSH, OpenSSH is not the only, only implementation of SSH, right? Um, but OpenSSH had a few things that we really liked. One is, um, you know, it's licensed appropriately for it. It's a permissive license, so that means that we can use it. Um, we just have to attribute it correctly and all that stuff. Um, it is actively developed, so it is not, you know, a quote unquote dead project. It actually has a lot of activity. They're at, you know, they're always ahead of us because they're moving so fast. Um, and also, there's a lot of 
you know, I think that the BSD Foundation, which owns OpenSA, has proven themselves as very strong security focused. So we have a lot of confidence that, yeah, I mean, like people make mistakes, we're human, right? You're going to have um, issues, but they're very quick to kind of patch these things. And we just need to make sure that we're just as quick to get it back into Windows as needed. Um, but yeah, so definitely, you know, from interoperability, capability, security, quality, uh, from our perspective, um, OpenSH was the only viable choice. So I sent you a little message before we did this asking like, hey, anything in particular you want to cover? And one thing you mentioned yeah. was AI and PowerShell. So what's up with that? You, you have a project, the Codex project. What's going on here? Okay. So I want to talk about this briefly. Um, so, so AI in the console specifically is something that is like a personal interest of mine. Um, I don't know if everyone is aware, but like PowerShell Core 6.0, uh, very early on, I had actually published a RFC talking about, you know, can we introduce some level of machine learning in the console to do like auto completions and stuff like that? And I, to be honest, I got a lot of pushback early on from both the team and from the community. And it goes back to telemetry, right? Um, you're not gonna necessarily run a uh, machine learning model locally. It it's, requires a lot of uh, training and all that. Um, so the natural thing for us would be, hey, you're gonna type something, we're gonna send that to Azure and we'll get back a response and we'll present it to you, right? And, and so at that point in time, I, to be honest, I don't remember when this was, this was like many years ago now. Um, I think that the community and our team was not ready for that level of uh, quote unquote intrusiveness, all right? I mean, sending data off of your system. Now, obviously, we have that today. Like our whole predictor framework and the Azure PowerShell predictor does exactly that, and, and it's been very successful, right? Uh, and, and I think part of that is really ensuring, you know, again, the data that's being sent is not used for anything outside of for this scenario. It is your own data that we just need because the machine learning. Uh, code exists, the neural net exists in Azure, we cannot actually have it on your local system. Um, so, you know, I'm very excited about a lot of stuff that we've done. And to be honest, it's proven very productive for myself. Like, I, again, I'm not an end user, so I don't use like Azure PowerShell directly a lot myself. But a lot of the um, framework that we built for like, you know, the history predictions and stuff like that, that saves me several seconds for everything. And if you add it up, saving me at least several minutes. And then if you add up for a week, it probably saved me like an hour or so or having to just type things out, right? Because because I working in Git, I do a lot of repetitive stuff. Um, so I think we've done a lot of interesting stuff there. Yes, I, I also published a, um, a a module in the gallery that's just um, by the way, it's, I never intend to get to 1.0. It, it is an experimental incubation project for learning called Codex, and that uses the OpenAI Codex, yeah. which is similar to like GitHub Copilot. Um, and you know, you can type something like. You know, if you don't know exactly what you want, um, but it's been trained on it, you can do something like as a comment, you know, uh, find me the highest CPU processes on the system, like in plain English. And basically it'll send it up to OpenAI and it'll, being that it's also trained on partial scripts, it'll return something that could work, right? It's not perfect, but it could work. Uh, so I find that to be very interesting. Uh, and one of the caveats I'll put out there for any of this auto completion stuff, you need to always review what's being sent back before you hit enter. Like I would never tell, no, no one should ever just accept it, all right, and just hit enter because who knows what's going to happen. Um, it, you should always shoot it as a suggestion. Um, but I find even like GitHub Copilot um, in VS Code, like I find it to be, like I never use the code that it spits out because a lot of times it doesn't compile. Um, but a lot of times it'll actually tell me about things that other people may have done that, oh, I didn't think about that. That's interesting. And, and I'll modify it for my own purposes, right? And, and Codex does the same thing. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, it is something that is not a priority for the team. We're not AI experts. We do, like, even for like the Azure PowerShell uh, predictor work, like, we worked with that team who worked with another team who's more on the um, AI specific work. Um, but I think there's definitely more opportunities for AI in the console to uh, help people be productive. Again, like one of the scenarios I really want to light up, and I don't mind talking about this because I don't think it's going to come anytime soon, is um, imagine if you're able to train a, a neural net on uh, all the support documents from you know Stack Overflow, assuming it's properly licensed and all that, or other places, right? And, and let's assume that you just type something and you get an error message on PowerShell. It's like get help dash AI or something like that. And it will actually send the contents of your, you know, what happened maybe most recently, maybe the last three. And if there's something that someone has already solved, wouldn't it be great if it just told you, 
here's why it failed and here's what you can do to solve it, right? Because um, today, people just naturally go open a browser and they search for themselves. Like, why not just shortcut that? Um, but obviously, the biggest problem is the content of training is also a problem. So. Yep. In our last episode, we talked about how we might be in a transitionary period with uh, education, knowledge bases, teaching people, getting up to date. And I think that AI and what you're describing is another great way to reduce friction and get people to contribute in a more secure and uh, efficient way. But yep. Jordan, what an amazing guest. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, sir. We know you have a... A hard cut off, but we appreciate you talking to us. I thought this was a light, a lot, very enlightening. I'm excited to dive into Codex now. I'm gonna yeah, definitely play with it. Uh, open up issues, submit PRs. Uh, again, it is a side project for me, so I don't take to it as a priority. But it's uh, I, I think it's a very interesting area that could use more uh, exploration. Awesome! And it sounds like you were a pioneer coming up with this idea years <laughs> ago. So awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, again, uh, I'm sorry I have to cut this time a little bit short, but uh, if you guys have other things you want to, we can do this again some other time in the future as well. So, Awesome. All right, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Got to go. Thank you. Yep. Bye. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. So I, I kind of feel bad for him though, because I took an informal poll of talking to myself in the corner and 83% of our guests actually only agree to do the show because they want a live seat while you spin just ear gold and shield for us. And so for him to come and spend all that time and not even get the payoff of listening to a master, just go out there and just crush it. Let's be honest. You're going to crush it this time is, is a real disappointment. So hopefully he can listen to this after he won't get the live version, but uh, we promise we won't edit it so he can still get the full experience. I take away, Andrew. Yeah, Steve Lee, I know you're a busy guy. Uh, why don't you just re-listen to the whole conversation again? Okay, there was some good stuff that you said. Listen to yourself. Uh, to everyone else who listened to this really awesome conversation, um, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it. Uh, give us a like, comment, subscribe on YouTube. Hit us with that five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. You can email us, PowerShell at pdq.com, or if you're on Twitter, at PowerShell Pod. Great job, Jordan. We did it again, man. Hit show. It's, it's, you know, hit show. That's fantastic. It's, this job is so easy. It just talk to awesome people. That's, I mean, I, we should do this more often. We should, like every week. Thanks for listening to the PowerShell Podcast with your hosts, Jordan Hammond and Andrew Plaw. He's a troublemaker. He's a rabble rouser. The PowerShell Podcast is a production of PDQ.com, making device management simple, secure, and pretty damn quick.